ok. Um, so, Professor uh, Christophilis Magidis um, is uh, currently professor at the Institute of World Politics and active field archaeologist in Greek for decades. And he's also the fifth president of the Mycenaean Foundation. He has received a vigorous classical education in the classical lyceum uh, of the Anavrita School at the University of Athens with a Bachelor in History and Archaeology, being awarded several, several honorary distinctions and scholarships for excellence. He further pursued graduate studies on prestigious fellowships such as the Fulbright William Penn and Charles William Fellowships at the University of Pennsylvania, where he awarded his PhD in classical archaeology and postdoctoral studies as a fellow at Brown University. Professor Magidis is an active field archaeologist with long field experience since 1985 at major archaeological sites such as Thera, Idean Cave and Arhanes in Crete, Glass Mycini, Mycini, and he is currently field director uh, of the Lower Town Excavations at Mycini and field director of the Sperchios Valley Archaeological Project. His main research interests focus on the Aegean prehistory, especially Minoan, Mycenaean pottery, architecture, religion, society, economy, and foreign relations, but also include classical Greek sculpture and architecture, archaeological methodology, and interpretation. So without further ado, let's invite uh, Professor Magidis to begin his talk. Well, thank you very much, Desmina. My thanks to you and the Department of Archaeology at York. Uh, welcome to all of you. I wish I were there. Uh, I don't know how the weather is there, uh, but over here in Greece, it's it's rather a, a British weather uh, for the time being. So uh, it is a great honor to follow after Oliver Dickinson, uh, who presented you with his view of uh, Minon Crete and the Cycladus. Uh, my lecture today will focus <clears throat> on uh, Mycenae, uh, where I've been excavating uh, since 1993. Uh, so it's been about 30 years uh, of excavation and serving there. So I will start my presentation with a brief introduction that is meant for you know the undergraduate students who have minimal contact with Mycenaean archaeologists, I'll give you the setting, uh, geography, geopolitics, and you know, chronology very, very briefly within five, seven minutes. And then uh, I'll move on to present uh, the three major excavations or discoveries that we made, uh, me and my team, um, uh, at Mycenae in the last 30 years. Uh, I will start with that are being, you know, in the process of being published. Uh, the first will be the lower, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, are, the palatial um, workshops at Mycenae, uh, then the lower the excavation, discovery and excavation of the lower town, and finally the palatial, the palace throne of Mycenae. <clears throat> All right. Ahiyawa. The land of the Ahi, according to the Hittites, and the, or the Naya, according to the Egyptians. Uh, it seems that Homer preserves the two international names of the Mycenaeans, Achaeoi and Danaoi, which we find in these two names, Ahi and Danaya. The Mycenaeans flourished in the 14th and 13th centuries BC, uh, late Helladic 3a and b, in south and mainland Greece. Uh, as you can see, uh, the great players in those times are the Hittites, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians, uh, with the Greeks, before the Greeks, the Minoans, and then the Greeks, the Achi, being the fourth major player in, in the area. This period is characterized by uh, regional centralization of power, state formation, advanced socioeconomic organization, and cultural homogenization. The palatial authorities organized production of agricultural surplus, uh, coordinated overseas trade, regulated socioeconomic life, and aided by palatial bureaucracy. Well, this culture homogeneity of Mycenaean material culture with 
regional variations and local traditions is known as Mycenaean Koine, 14th and 13th century BC. This cultural homogeneity may be interpreted either as an end result of a gradual and complex process of acculturation towards uniformity through peer quality contexts of politically independent palatial states, that's the theory of political fragmentation, or alternatively, we can see it as a byproduct of a certain degree of political unification of vassal palace states under the rule of Mycenae. This is the Achaean Empire theory. Uh, in the map, we see the Mycenaean expansion. Uh, the Mycenaeans, uh, after 1400 BC, and Professor uh, Dickinson will explain his next uh, uh, talk, you know, the the connection between the Sandorini explosion, volcanic explosion, and the changes, the geopolitical changes in the Aegean. Uh, but it seems that um, <clears throat> at around 1400 or slightly earlier, the Mycenaeans infiltrate Crete, uh, occupy the island, and from there on, Crete becomes a province of the Mycenaean world, and as well as all its colonies and trade posts. So the Mycenaeans uh, expand all over the eastern and to a great part of the, the western Mediterranean as well. And for the next two centuries, we have the Mycenaean Koine. Especially I'm focusing now at Mycenae, in the Argolid and Mycenae, uh, you can view Mycenae after 150, 60 years of excavations, we can view it as a consent, three concentric circles. In the center, we have the citadel that fortifies and protects uh, all the, uh, you know, the important uh, infrastructure, the palatial authority, the officials, priesthood, workshops, temples. And then outside the next circle is the circle uh, that contains the lower town. Uh, the previous theory was that there was no lower town. In fact, we have proved that there is one. Uh, according to the previous theory, the, there was small villages with separate drainage systems, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So we have an extent uh, lower town and around it, from of which just before we started excavations, there are only 11 houses had been excavated or partially or totally. And now we have plenty more, but you know, still it's too few for a 15,000 people town around the citadel. And then the outer circle is a circle of the cemeteries, uh, chamber tomb cemeteries all around, forming an invisible and invincible wall of spirits and a kind of a territorial marker. Uh, uh, basically, as one crosses through this zone, getting into urban setting or from urban setting to agricultural setting. That's uh, the citadel of Mycenae. You can see the Lion Gate and then Grave Circle A, Cult Center, the official quarters, the palace. We're going to focus here later the palatial workshops, which is the east wing and the underground fountain. And here you can see the different phases of the construction of uh, the walls following different techniques, still all of them cyclopean walls, but following different techniques, different foundation uh, patterns. Uh, first wall 1350, second wall 1250, about 1250 BC with a southwest extension. And uh, then the final one, 1200 BC, with the, nor the Northeast extension. Uh, remind, uh, I need to remind you here that these huge walls, five to eight meters thick, uh, 18 to 20 to, uh, I'm sorry, 12 to 18 meters tall, uh, made in the Cyclopean technique, you know, kind of a sandwich of Cyclopean faces with a core in between. Uh, they were mainly meant uh, not to protect because, you know, these people were fighting with slings and spears and arrows. These are huge walls for that kind of, of warfare. Uh, and this was mainly um, projecting power and um, image. Uh, and this is also supported by the fact that for a, about 150 years, there was no water provision in the citadel. 
when they were actually in danger, then they add in Athens, Aptirians, and the Mycenae, the underground fountains at about 1200 BC. <clears throat> and this is the chronology of the Greek mainland Crete and Cycladus. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, we have the first two centuries, just before 1600 to about 1400, the period of emergence. Uh, this is the period of the shaft graves, uh, when we have the Mycenaean chiefdoms. And then eventually we have, from after 1400 to 1200, the peak of the Mycenaean power, the acme and the expansion of the Mycenaean world in the next two centuries, the so-called Mycenaean Koine, late Hellenic 3a and 3b. And finally, the decline and fall of the Mycenaean world uh, within about 100 years or so, due to several factors, environmental factors, uh, earthquake storms, climatic changes that affect production and movement of populations, and also crop disease and overexploitation of resources. But at the same time, cultural uh, reasons, geopolitical changes, the severance of foreign, the foreign sector of economy, uh, of the palaces abroad uh, because of the descent of the sea peoples and the destruction of the seaports in Syria and Palestine, and of course, civil wars and uprisings. So all of this is happening within the same 50, 100 years. And all this with combined force brings the Mycenaeans, and not only the Mycenaeans, but also um, the Hittites and the Assyrians to their knees. Especially at Mycenae, we have studied the pottery uh, and we have correlated, Jacobitis has done that. Uh, uh, we have studied the pottery and correlated identical pottery. Uh, we found identical pottery uh, in different contemporary uh, stratified and sealed contexts. So we have reconstructed four or five major destruction horizons that help us a lot in terms of chronology. Uh, the first one is very partial, as you can see here. You know, the Petsas house, the date, uh, the post-event status, and other catastrophes uh, in other areas. The major uh, horizon is around 1250, 1240 BC, uh, strong earthquake and fires. Uh, we have the same thing at Tiryns in Thebes and, and possibly in Troy. So we have destructions in inside the citadel and outside, uh, also in the palace. Uh, uh, and other areas inside and outside. Then we have, you know, re reconstruction of the whole area. Some of them are abandoned. Some of them we have major repairs. And then uh, a terrible uh, destruction horizon with fires at the end of late Hellenic 3B2 at around 1200 or slightly later. Um, at that time, much is destroyed, and very, very few things survive, partially restored, reacted on a smaller scale, or abandoned. Then localized and limited fires in late Hellenic 3C, and then buildings and areas gradually abandoned there without traces of destruction. Very good work that allows us to have a nice uh, stratified, you know, and chronological time frame. So I'm going to start with. Uh, the palatial workshops, uh, you can see them here. Uh, palatial workshops were first uh, excavated by Tsundas in 1889, 1890, 1892. He published nothing. Then Wace in 1939, he published uh, the House of Columns and uh, you know Eastern Wing of um, uh, the crap the. Uh, Artisan's Quarters, which he thought mistakenly that was part of the House of Columns. Then Milonas excavates in 1965-1967. And uh, finally, I was appointed by the Archaeological Society to study and publish all of that, uh, which I'm doing now with several good colleagues. Uh, we're ready, we're almost there uh, to complete the volume of the palatial workshops. <clears throat> And here you can see an aerial view of the artisans' quarters and the House of Columns. These are part of, as you can see, of the palatial complex. That's the east wing of the palatial complex. Uh, the palace complex is right here. Here you can see the later, late Hellenic 3B palace, the 13th century BC palace. And then 
uh, here was the area of the earlier palace. Uh, these complexes, these units are divided and connected by two corridors, uh, right here, number nine, and number eight, right there. And then another curved corridor with A here that divides and connects all this main complex with the east wing, uh, which is the palatial uh, workshop. So overall, uh, the total size of the palatial complex of Mycenae is 12,000 square meters. That's twice the size of the palatial complex of Tiryns and Pylos, and it's very close to the total size of the palatial complex of Knossos, which is about 13,000 square meters. So by far, if we exclude Gla, uh, Mycenae is the biggest palatial, has the biggest palatial complex on mainland Greece. We have done LIDAR, Professor Lianos has done this, and 3D scan, so we have the whole area to uh, scan to millimeter. And from there, we can create reconstructions of the palatial workshops. We can uh, create uh, cross sections. You can see the architectural plan that resulted from this. This is accurate to, to the millimeter. And then all the cross sections are being automatically derived uh, by uh, the GIS and uh, the, the LiDAR images in full detail. And this helped us a lot to study not only the different uh, terraces, because all these royal workshops were built with, you know, on artificial terraces with uh, retaining walls, uh, unified drainage system. There's a lot of central planning to this, but also the palatial construction with about two, 2.5, three meter stone walls uh, reinforced with uh, timber frame uh, as we find the traces. Uh, and then the second floor of mud brick, roof tiles and so on and so forth. So we can study with, with the use of the LiDAR images and the cross sections we can also create 3D reconstructions. Uh, for the very first time, we saw what really the Royal, the Artisan's Quarters looked like. It's like a factory. We have two wings, the, east, uh, the West Wing and the East Wing. And then they have two corridors in front of the rooms. And then in the center of the whole thing, uh, uh, an outdoor long, uh, court with a big drain to collect water. Now this, along with the discovery of roof tiles, suggests that the roofs were inclined uh, on both these wings towards the central court. Then this was the central entrance and then a staircase would lead up to the second floor where we had balconies uh, and uh, terrace and balconies and, and corridors. Uh, the top um, rooms were actually the, where the artisans would um, reside and work. The uh, ground floor was meant for storage of materials. And these are the 3D uh, reconstructions uh, made by the Institute for the Visualization, Visualization of History based on my drawings and the study uh, of uh, the architecture uh, as you can see, we have recreated uh, uh, the outside, but also the inside uh, of the artisans' uh, quarters to great detail based on the architectural finds and the archaeological, the archaeological finds and the architectural evidence. Uh, this is the outdoor courtyard and then a view of the terraces with columns. And on the right-hand side, you see the construction of the upper rooms with internal ladders and trap doors. And then we embedded the 3D reconstructions and actual photographs of Mycenae. Uh, you get a sense of the size of these workshops. Uh, of course, here, what you're missing is a huge uh, volume of, of the palaces and everything else. But nevertheless, you get a sense of the contextual, contextualization of, of these buildings. The other one, the House of Columns, which you see here, was excavated mainly by Waze and published by Waze. 
Uh, here we have uh, a megaron structure, which is the second biggest megaron on the citadel of Mycenae, uh, and a courtyard uh, framed by colonnades, as well as uh, further down here, uh, two or three stories of storms in which uh, supplies, food supplies, uh, and other things were stored. One jar had a linear B inscription, and we also found uh, a linear B tablet there. So we assume that this is the residence of a supervisor, possibly a member of the royal family, who will who control the uh, influx of raw material uh, and then the allocation of this material to the workmen who will work next door. This building is slightly later than the artisans' quarters. Both were built in late Helladic 3 B2 after 1250 BC. Uh, and when they added this uh, structure, then they opened up uh, a few uh, doors and windows there and connected the two structures. And obviously, the man who was in charge here was responsible for the line of production and also for providing food rations to the workmen. In uh, the, the royal workshops, we have found tools uh, like needles, spatulas, grinders, chisels, lead weights, even a rock crystal magnifying lens. Uh, also, open molds for uh, goldsmiths, found traces of gold, silver, and copper, uh, and yellow sulfur glue uh, for inlays. Uh, Microlithics, we have found cores of green, uh, uh, green steatite, rock crystal, quartz, uh, agate, opal, Egyptian blue, and even a lot of frescoes uh, second use of fresco fragments, recycling them for producing uh, lime. Among the finds, we have half finished uh, objects, uh, but also, especially, 1473 ivory cutouts and you know, discards uh, that also support the evidence. It's evidence that supports, uh, you know, the um, the theory of workshops there. And of course, finished products like, you know, beads and inlays. And furthermore, lots of pottery and figurines that help us with the actual dating. So the principal conclusions of, of the study and the excavation study and the forthcoming publication of Palatia workshops is that we have definitely concluded that this was an integral part of the palatial complex based on location, architecture, and portable finds. We have worked on the dating, and it seems that there is a correlation with the ivory houses outside the cyclopean walls. We've done an assessment of the palatial control over the raw material importation, the production line, marketing and exploitation, or use of the finished products. We have established uh, the architectural form of a typical workshop and identification criteria uh, for similar workspaces elsewhere. And finally, uh, we examine the possibility of varied specialization of palatial sites and allocation of personnel, perhaps when raw material and market access in different palaces. It appears that we have different specializations in different palatial sites. So these are the principal you know, conclusions or important keys for the forthcoming publication of the palatial workshops. Now, we're going to move to the lower town. Uh, according to Homer, Epimeni, Evriagia, Polychrysos, Mukini, well-built, uh, broad, broaded, and uh, uh, filled in gold, uh, rich in gold from Mycenae. The excavations, uh, the renewed excavations of uh, the lower town um, started 
uh, in 2007. Before that, I was working with Professor Yakovirich, he's my mentor, was my mentor. Uh, and uh, at some point, we decided to work at the same time at the Lower Town alongside with excavating inside the Citadel. This photograph is from excavating um, building Kappa inside the Citadel. And the excavation outside started in 2007 and continued to 2015. And from there on, we started, you know, the, the study seasons uh, and continuing somewhat with a survey, but also starting the study seasons. We have finished uh, the first volume uh, uh, of the geophysical uh, and archaeological survey. Uh, and now we're moving on to the second volume, which is... Um, the results of the excavation of the lower town. And this is a photograph of uh, the work at Mycenae. This photograph is actually from 2000, uh, from 2011, where you can see uh, uh, there were some years that they had 150 people on site uh, excavating. Uh, here was another team surveying, uh, starting in the museum were working in both sides. Here are some other photographs. Uh, in those 20 something years, uh, we had about 400 or more undergraduate students and graduate students at Mycenae and more than 30 uh, faculty members. Now, before we excavated, we had an extensive uh, uh, survey and topographical survey using ground penetrating radar, gradiometer, total station, aerial photography. I mean, the aerial photography of those times was this, nothing that we're doing right now with drones and everything else. Uh, that technology was not around in 2000, at least in our corner of the world. Uh, but we used a lot of um, geophysical methods, actually four or five of them, even geoacoustics and combined it, and that gave us uh, a view of the lower town before we even started excavating. Uh, this is the survey area to the south of the Acropolis of the Citadel and alongside the modern highway and the old highway, Messina Highway, that will come from Corinth and go to the Lion Gate. This is the area that we surveyed and further excavated. Uh, I managed to get uh, uh, an aerial photograph of the geographical service, uh, the military geographical service. Uh, and when we analyzed it, we started looking at crop marks and ghost traces of walls. Then we use the Erdos imaging software and the red areas depict higher probability of construction. Uh, so you see it showed us the very same areas. At that point, we got a permit and we started using three different methods uh, gradiometer, which is magnetometry. You see how the image would come out here and then how it's interpreted. Red is the negative anomalies, stone walls, green is the positive anomalies, soil field features and trenches, and the blue is the bipolar anomalies, metallic objects and burnt material. Uh, and the same area, end of acres, uh, was done with uh, gradiometer, uh, GPR, geoacoustics, and ERT, electrical resistivity tomography. Now, the most astonishing find was two gates. This is a central gate, and you can see the blow up here. You can see it in the, gra in the gradiometer image, and here you can see it in the GPR image. We have two uh, towers and the gate in between. Obviously, these gates are connected with another circle, uh, a, a wall, uh, an outer wall that protected an important part of the lower town and probably the industrial sector of the, of the lower town, which we discovered. And here you can see the road that goes up and goes through the gates. Uh, this is the Mycenaean road, which goes alongside the modern road um, further to, to the east, but parallel to it, and that will go all the way to the Lion Gate. So we have one gate here 
and another gate next to the dam. There was a dam at the Havos Gorge there. Uh, and that is the gate and part of the, of the fortification wall that you see here. So we have to imagine that there's more, uh, another section of the fortification wall that would run right here. And then up on, I'll show you to you on another image. This is an astonishing discovery. Um, unfortunately, we haven't touched it yet because it lies on fields uh, that I, I couldn't excavate it. We excavated this area here because this was the area that I could purchase. But I also purchased all these acres here. So they're now under my name. And that's what we're planning to return and excavate and at least bring to light this particular uh, gate next to the Harbour Forge. Now, if you blow it up further, you see huge complexes the size of um, uh, the oil merchant group. And even if you blow it further away, further up, uh, yeah, you see, you know, a whole town built in, you know, south of the citadel. Obviously, many, many more buildings existed all around the citadel in the second circle. Uh, around the citadel. Here you can see the two gates, the central gate and the east gate. You know, probably a wall was running like this, going all the way up to the Panaya houses. And this is the first Mycenaean bridge done here, and then the second one there. And this is the old Mycenaean road coming through the central gate. And as you can see, it's parallel to the modern road coming up. We also did, you know, deep trenches and we found two fields. Uh, there is a, a red field number one, which is pre-Mycenaean, way deeper. It appears that all this area was an agricultural, uh, agricultural fields until the middle of uh, the 13th century BC, when the citadel expanded with a southwest extension. Uh, the Lion Gate was built, the Postern Gate was built, and then the need rose for the extended an extension of, of the lower town. And what they did is they changed uh, this agricultural, transformed this agricultural area into urban setting. Then we have the Mycenaean structures built on the red field. And the post, there's another red field, the second horizon, post-Mycenaean, uh, which probably came either, or actually not either, or both and from the, the gorge, the Havos Gorge, and from the hills, and fill the area. And on that field, we have all the post Mycenaean structures built later on. Just to make sure, we did uh, an ERT, uh, electrical resistivity tomography. Uh, and uh, this went down to 16 meters. Uh, and it came up that actual archaeological layers which you see here in red uh, are the architectural remains um, so any further down was just feel so we're quite sure that we didn't need to go further down than you know about three meters or uh, 3.5 meters So this is how we started excavating. This is the general grid of Mycenae from the Atlas of Mycenae. And that area here, uh, four grid squares, uh, which were divided into uh, smaller grid squares of five by five. And eventually uh, more than 15, 18 grid squares were excavated to the depth, varying depths from you know, uh, a few centimeters down to about three meters. Uh, and various structures were identified. I'm gonna emphasize mostly the Mycenaean ones, but I'll let you know uh, which ones are the later because that's also important. Uh, here are the different faces. In red, we have the Mycenaeans, the Mycenaean uh, structures, wall A, the bottom part of wall Vita and Gamma, part of the structure four and some structures here under the um, circular silos 
um, and more rooms here uh, in uh, structure eight. All this is Mycenaean. And then uh, we have uh, the dark red here, proto-geometric. On top of that, we have the, all the light blue, which is geometric. And finally, archaic. And also we found some Hellenistic as well. There's no classical period uh, in Mycenae. This is an aerial view of, of the excavation uh, between 2000, that's, uh, 2000, uh, 2011 uh, photograph. Here's wall, Vita and Rama. And here in the circle, you can see the, geom the gradiometer image uh, the bottom of that part of that wall, Vita and Rama, is Mycenaean. The top part was added later or repaired later in you know, geomet post Mycenaean and probably geometric times. Uh, this wall, we don't know its original use, but it functioned uh, as a secondary use. It functioned as a retaining wall for all the soil that would come from the north and from, from the east. And therefore, it acted as a retaining wall, and as a result, uh, it got damaged a lot. You can see the S curve of the wall. Uh, it acted as a mattress, but the original purpose of the wall must, must have been uh, different. Here you can see wall vita and wall gamma, and the later repairs we removed, you know, sheds from the thickness of the wall and from the foundations. So we have dated the different uh, successive repair uh, repairs of the wall. And this is quite interesting. That's the Mycenaean level down here at the base of wall Vita. And that up here at point, 1.5 meters on top, we have a, a geometric grave of about 800 BC. So here's the debris flow. The post Mycenaean red field, number two field, is about 1.5 meters. And on top of that field, or cut into that field, uh, the later structures were built. And here's the geometric uh, cyst grave with a female skeleton that died of an arrow wound and was buried next to the wall. Just We did the GIS uh, inquiry and then we found out that the majority of slings and projectile points that were discovered in the industrial sector of the lower town were found around wall Vita and Gamma and around wall Alpha, wall A. So it seems that this wall, these two Mycenaean walls were originally built and they were used in some way uh, connected with the defensive system of the Cyclopean or whatever else wall lied out there connecting the two gates. But later on, when the site was abandoned, uh, then we had, um, they acted as buttresses uh, or retaining walls for the incoming, for the influx of uh, red soil. Again, the, you can see the Mycenaean buildings here, Delta and Epsilon uh, structure uh, eight uh, that are attached to the walls of Vita and Rama. So we have plenty of Mycenaean stuff there at uh, a depth of one meter, one meter and a half and below. Uh, the extended, this is, you can see here the images, the gyreometer images, the geomagnetic, actually the geomagnetic and the GPR images were 95, 96% accurate. Uh, so whatever we would see on the images, we would find by excavation. Very, very helpful. Um, and then here you can see this wall was cut off and then two circular structures were added, probably xylos, as we can judge from the shape and the finds. And this xylos, geometric in, in time, in, uh, in date, uh, they laid they were laid over uh, Mycenaean structures uh, that you can see down here. Here you can see the circular buildings uh, five and six and the Mycenaean structure 
of seven lying underneath. Excellent stratigraphy. That's the very first time at my scene, after 160 years, that we have found stratified succession of buildings, not layers, buildings ranging from the 13th century all the way to the Hellenistic, with the exception of, of classical. It's the very first time that we have found five, six, you know, uh, settlements, one on top of the other uh, in actual ruins. Also, this peculiar structure that you see here, uh, identified in the gradiometer. At the beginning, when we started excavating, we thought it was a kind of a kiln, but the actual excavation here, you can see the GPR image and the gradiometer image, but when we actually excavated it, we found it was a kind of a well uh, that originally went down into the Mycenaean times and eventually the walls of the well uh, were built over and repaired in five or six different sections. Uh, at the bottom of the well, there were carved steps getting down there. And at some point in the Hellenistic period, the well stopped being used and they dumped everything there and used it uh, as a, a trash bin. This is wall A. Again, as you can see, it had a normal face here, Cyclopean uh, wall. And then on the other side, there was no face. Uh, so probably, we don't know the exact use, but as I said, we found a lot of projectiles that might have been part of the defensive system. But when it was abandoned, a lot of red soil came from uh, the gorge and then backfilled all that area. If you look at the actual wall, here's the finished side, this is the inner side, and here there was no cut at all. So this was not built to protect as a retaining wall from the field, but it was, you know, it was lying there. It was built there for a different purpose. And as secondary use, uh, it functioned as a retaining wall. On that wall, uh, that created basically a, a, a natural terrace, natural slash artificial terrace, were built houses and workshops of the geometric and uh, uh, the uh, later periods, uh, structures one, two, three, as you can see here, uh, Number one uh, has several rooms, and that was uh, a ceramic uh, workshop where we also find some ivory pieces. And then in building two, which is further to the north, you can see the traces here, the GPR and uh, the magnetometry traces. We found more rooms with uh, skeletons uh, of three babies, uh, one like, hmm? hello? Oh no, it's fine, we can continue. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, no, everything is fine. Somebody in the room and uh, I muted them, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, so we have here uh, one skeleton and then two, uh, embracing each other, two skeletons here of infants. And finally, the upside of building three, which is proto-geometric and lies underneath one and three. Another thing that we did in the lower town is that we uh, used the gradiometer on all nine colostrums. And in all of them, we found a central trace, uh, which is a trace of a central beam uh, on which they would tie a rope and with the use of the rope, they would actually um, uh, design uh, the, the diameter of uh, the tomb. And by extending the rope, they would create the inclination of the vaulted roof. That's very, very interesting. And that, you know, basically it uh, supports and gives evidence to the theory. I think Elizabeth French also mentioned that in a couple of articles of how these uh, structures were built. But in the treasure of Atreus, we found something more, much more uh, uh, interesting. We found traces 
of actual houses, Mycenaean houses beneath. This is the continuation of the Katopanagia houses. Obviously, the king, whoever the king was at around 1250-1240, the very same king who expanded, you know, the citadel, built the Lion Gate, fought in Asia Minor at some point uh, against the Hittites. Uh, and this king decided to build his tomb there. There was no other available place. The better, best place in the area was in that area over there because that was the very best thing you would see coming up to the main road uh, on your way to Mycenae. So he expropriated uh, the, the Mycenaean houses, erased them, uh, and he built the treasure of Atreus on top of a sector of the Katopanaya houses. Of course, we have thousands of finds from the lower town, hundreds of figurines from all periods, uh, seals, rings, jewelry, buttons, uh, loom weights, literally thousands of finds from stratified and non-stratified uh, deposits, uh, a lot of architectural material, including nails um, and other parts. For example, this one is a lead connector for, uh, for a, dis a damaged uh, clay jar. Uh, and, of course, pottery from all different periods, excluding the classical period, from the late Helladic 3B2 all the way down to the Hellenistic. Here we did also LIDAR. We have the whole area of Mycenae, uh, of the lower town, uh, in 3D. Uh, you can actually, there's a video uh, on YouTube uh, where you can actually see uh, in, in 3D uh, the whole lower town again spanned to millimeters and because of this we have very precise cross sections and we're now doing the reconstructions of the buildings in the same way that we did uh, the artisans workshops so the main discoveries of the lower town of Mycenae we established the size of the lower town and did a discovery of the industrial sector of the, of the town Two external gates, presumably parts of an outer fortification wall, that perhaps change what we think about Mycenae. Uh, and I'll tell you more about this at the end. And the Mycenaean road leading up to the Lion Gate. Uh, we established stratigraphy, phasing, and chronology. We have certification for the very first time at Mycenae after 160 years, 70 years, certification of superimposed buildings from six different places. Uh, so from six different phases. So we have continuation of inhabitation with no actual hiatus there. Uh, we did an assessment of palatial control over land, resources, and infrastructure, uh, road system, bridges, dams, retaining walls, and terracing, irrigation. And we studied the transformation process from agricultural land to urban setting. And as I said, we have thousands of portable finds from stratified contexts, and of course, the discovery of the palace throne. Last part, the Mycenaean throne identification criteria. Uh, obviously, the throne was found out of context, so we had to prove in many different ways that it was part of the throne, and we used the fine spot, context, topography, taphonomy damage, typology and form, dimensions and proportions, materials and technique, comparanda, and historical and literary sources. The Mycenaean palace is the so-called Megarn. The Megarn, for those who have little knowledge of Mycenaean archaeology, is a rectangular uh, structure that has three rooms, the Ethosa, with two columns in Antis, which is a semi-open room, then the Prodomos, or pre-chamber, and then the main Domus, uh, the throne room. Actually, this should be called the hearth room, because it has a circular hearth uh, with four columns surrounding it to support the lantern for the smoke of the fire to escape, and then the throne placed on the right-hand side as you come in. Here you see uh, the almost identical in proportions, decoration, materials, and size, almost identical uh, mega of Mycenae, Pylos, and Terence. Uh, at Mycenae, the original palace was up here, uh, with a north-south orientation in the 14th century, but in the 13th century, they moved it down here with an east-west orientation 
in a lower area protected from the northern winds and with a great view over the Argo the plain. But the area, the, 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 the space was not enough. So they created an artificial terrace that was supported by the Cyclopean Wall. The Cyclopean Wall, right under the palace right here, acted also as a retaining wall, as a buttress for uh, uh, the throne room. And here you see the part of the throne room that went down into the Havos River in 1200 BC in that destruction horizon, terrible earthquake. And the Mycenaeans, are, in a single moment, they saw their throne and their you know, palace collapsing into uh, the Kavos River. Uh, along with the throne, a uh, collapsed part of the heart, the floor, of course, here, and this, the southeastern uh, column. Uh, and here you can see this column was, re was retrieved in the 1950s, about 70 years ago, uh, by the workmen of Orlando's. When Orlando's was actually uh, putting together and restoring the palace, he sent his workmen down there and told them to find a stone that looked like these three stones. That stone was found in the very same area that we discovered um, uh, the piece of the throne that probably had collapsed uh, along with it in 1200 BC. Here's the actual crack. And then you can find on YouTube, in the Mac videos, you'll find the discovery uh, of the throne of Agamemnon, a video that was created by Professor Janos based on the evidence that we have from the throne. And you will see the moment of destruction and how it went down, tumbled down the slope. Uh, here's, you know, the free fall, the rolling, and the final deposition. We have found uh, crash damage, uh, uh, rolling damage, and low impact damages from the final deposition. And this is a photograph of the fine spot. And the dimensions of the surviving part, uh, about 54 by 35 and 23. Uh, the original dimensions must have been about 50 by 70, and the whole thing along with the uh, back uh, uh, would be about 250 kilos. You see other seats, you know, from Katsambas, from Miristis and Fit. Here's the Mycenae, here's the uh, seat from Knossos and the Knossos throne. The diagnostic features of a seat, are the form and the shape of the seat's ledge all around, uh, the contact traces of a backrest slab, the small depth of the seat depression and the seat depression sloping to the rear. Here is, you know, the uh, traces of the backrest uh, slab on the rear ledge of the seat and the reconstruction of it made by Professor Janos. And this is the seat uh, depression at my seat. It's about three centimeters, it's also 3.5. And you see how it gently goes deeper uh, in the rear side just like all typical seats. Here's a, uh, a comparison between the Mycenae throne and the Knossos throne. And if you look at the study of proportions, uh, we have close analogies. Uh, we have identical depth and width proportion, identical maximum depth of the central depression dipping towards the backrest. Uh, the maximum length of the seat depression is bigger than Knossos, the Knossos throne, but consisted with the size of the skeletons in grave circle eight mycenae, obviously mycenae were bigger in terms of anthropometric analysis. The contact zone of the backrest occupies the same proportion with the total width of the rear ledge, and the raised base of mycenae has the same length width proportion to that of the uh, base thrown. So the study of proportions along with the construction uh, shows that this was a seat and actually a throne, almost identical to that of Knossos. Also, by looking into you know, the different publications and uh, uh, in, the, in the museum of Mycenae, the storms, um, and an article of Elizabeth French mentioned that, uh, and that led me to, to look at these pieces. There are three pieces, two of them join of green steatite with um, a, a spiral theme that were found in three different areas of um, 
uh, Mycenae, of the city of Mycenae. Obviously, after the catastrophe, people went there and collected pieces that remained from the throne. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, this is, uh, uh, these were parts of the decoration of the base of the throne, just like the throne, the serpentine base of the throne of Tyrants. Of course, the throne of uh, Knossos was built out of alabaster, and the point of that was to uh, create a symbolism of the connections with the great power of Crete uh, with the Egyptians. Uh, at Mycenae, the throne is made um, of the local limestone, uh, and then, I mean, mm -hmm. It, it gives a different connotation, giving different symbolism, a symbolism of autochthony and antiquity. Uh, it is made of the same material uh, of, of the actual citadel. And imagine it as an outcrop, a sacred outcrop coming out from the painted uh, floor of the palace, being a, a fixed point, you know, a point, a symbol of autochthony. And antiquity, so a very different aim than that of the Minon Thronos at, at Knossos. Now, <clears throat> as a result from the study of the throne, we have what is evident is that there is a formalization and standardization of the ultimate palatial power symbol. The selection of the material, the local limestone, and especially the combination of the local limestone, beautifully polished with green serpentine, is clearly palatial, both at Mycenae and Tyrus. And that selection of material creates memory of autochthony and antiquity and conveys symbolisms of power and prestige. Also, collecting the throne relics is an attempt to preserve memory. And this is how collective, you know, actual historical memory of the catastrophe was transformed into collective historical memory and eventually to mythology, the Atreid mythical cycle. Now, let me finish with this. The count, you know, the, the theory of, of a large Achillean state ruled by a single great Wanax. We talked earlier about the two different theories. We have palatial states with possibly Mycenae, Primus, and Tepharis, or an Achaean empire. And we have evidence uh, for one side and the other side. Now, the theory for a larger Achaean state ruled by single great Wanax is collaborated by the remarkable uniformity of palatial bureaucracy in script and agrees also with the official view from abroad the Hittite tablets place Ahiyawa overseas on mainland Greece, which military and territorial proportions that far exceed those of even the largest Mycenaean palace states, and recognize their king as an equal, great king, Lugal, Gal, uh, in the Tao Galawa letter, and list him among the other great kings of equal status that ruled on vassal states, like in Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, and Hatti, the Amuro Treaty. The problem rises when we try to reconcile the Hittite tablets that view an Achaean empire with the linear B tablets, which mention a Wanax and a Lawageda at the top of the local social political pyramid of each Mycenaean palace state, thus potentially indicating the existence of multiple kings. However, we simply cannot establish whether or not the Wanax at Pilos or at Thebes was the same person as the one at Mycenae. Therefore, one could argue that the Mycenaean equivalent for a great king may have been a single great Wanax, while each of, the, of his vassals may have been designated as Lawagetas, a title reserved for subordinate regional kings. The theory of a single great Wanax finds further support in the patterns of uniformity and variation among Mycenaean palaces and their throne rooms. First of all, the architectural standardization and uniformity of the Mycenaean palatial megara would make perfect sense if these palaces were built like duplicates to house the same official, the great Wanax, during his regular visits in his peripheral vassal kingdoms. Furthermore, whereas the palaces of Pylos 
Tyrins and Glass comprise two adjacent throne rooms, which are thought to have been the official residence of the Wanax, the large Megaron, and Lawagetas, so the small Megaron. Mycenae is the only palace with a single Megaron and a single throne room. The absence of a second throne room for a local Lawagetas and Mycenae would make sense only if Mycenae was the capital of the great Wanax, where his main palace and permanent throne were located. Interestingly, Mycenae, as I said before, is the only palace throne room furnished with a stone throne, a permanent throne. A monumental throne like that of Mycenae or Knossos, made of permanent rather than perishable material, must have been a more emphatic symbol of antiquity, power, and stability. The throne rooms of the other palaces were furnished with platforms for gilded wooden thrones, probably intended to duplicate and substitute for the permanent stone throne for the great Wanax to use during his regular visits. The heartland of the single great Wanax may be reasonably identified as the Argolid, with Mycenae as the official seat and capital of power, controlling vassals, vassal, palace states on mainland Greece and overseas to judge from a number of factors. The palace of Mycenae is the earliest of all Mycenaean palaces. The palace complex of Mycenae is by far the largest, twice the size of all the other Mycenaean palaces, excluding Black. Mycenae is the only palace with a single palatial megaron and a single throne room. The throne room at Mycenae was furnished with the only stone throne on mainland Greece. The scale and monumentality of the Cyclopean fortifications in the Argolid, Mycenae and Tyrians combined, is unmatched on mainland Greece. And especially if we add the possibility of another wall fortification ring outside the Cyclopean walls protecting the lower town, that brings us much closer to an empire model. Mycenae is the only palatial site with nine monumental royal follows tombs built around the citadel and the lower town. Mycenae was the most powerful Mycenaean palace states with the strongest international contacts, trade and activity, exports and foreign imports in the period of the Hiawa tablets in the so-called Mycenaean coiny. So the comparative study of Mycenaean throne rooms and palaces produces patterns of uniformity and advanced standardization, as well as patterns of variation that may reflect empire to vassal power dynamics and geopolitical relations between the palace of Mycenae and other palace centers, thus allowing alternative readings and interpretations of the Mycenaean political geography. Thank you for your attention. And for those who would like to learn more about the excavations, uh, you can log in to the Mycenae website or the site of the Mycenaean Foundation. Thank you very much. That was great. So any questions in the room? Uh, let's stop sharing, I think, and 